On behalf of uh, Dean Douglas Anderson, I'm uh, happy to welcome you to this Dean's Convocation. Uh, my name's uh, Dr. Stephen Hanks. Uh, I teach in the Management Department and direct the uh, Masters in Human Resources uh, here at Utah State. Uh, we are really lucky today to have uh, Mark James here with us. Uh, Mark James is currently the Senior Vice President of Human Resources and Communications at uh, Honeywell. Uh, Honeywell is a diversified corporation with about 30, it's about a $37 billion diversified corporation, technology and manufacturing company, serving customers in aerospace, automation control, automotive and chemistry indus uh, industries. Mark's a member of Honey's, Honeywell's senior leadership team. Uh, I would also add that in addition to HR and communications, uh, Mark is responsible for global procurement. Uh, so you were telling me that for between, uh, uh, between the people budget and the procurement budget, about uh, 30 of the 37 billion uh, you spend each year. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a pretty good checkbook to have there, I think, uh, with a lot of accountability that comes with that. Uh, he's responsible for leading global human resources strategy and programs for the company's 120,000 employees in more than 130 companies. And as you think about 120,000 employees, imagine the challenge of making sure that 120,000 people are productively engaged. This includes organization and talent development, staffing, learning, compensation, benefits, labor and employee relations, HR services, as well as Six Sigma uh, throughout the organization. Uh, he, his role also includes leading the company's procurement, communications, and aviation functions. So uh, the uh, corporate fleet is under his direction as well. Anyway, um, Mark has worked in a number of organizations, including uh, AT&T, um, uh, let's see, uh, I'm jumping around here. AT&T, Lockheed Mark, Martin, uh, he's been with Toyota, uh, and a number of uh, other organizations. And uh, I told him I was going light on that introduction in hopes that he would kind of tell you a little about uh, where his career took him from his bachelor's degree here in business uh, at uh, Utah State University uh, to... Uh, to the uh, corporate headquarters of Honeywell in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, with this, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Mark James. Hi, thank you. I appreciate you coming on a uh, Friday. I understand that that's uh, a, little, a little more difficult. Now it can be louder. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, so I do, I do remember being a student here. And I'll tell you that I never set out to be an executive. I can honestly say it never crossed my mind once. I just wanted to earn some okay money so I could pay the bills and not worry about it. I didn't want to be rich. Uh, I just wanted to have some challenging work and not be like some of my relatives that were 30 years working at a particular place. And they would moan and groan about it when we'd get together. And I'd go, well, why don't you just quit and go somewhere else if it's so horrible? And they'd say, oh, I'm committed now and a pension and blah, blah. And I just thought, boy, I don't want to do that. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Honeywell, just so you know where I'm coming from. And then I'll talk to you about succeeding in your career and then what I call the seven derailers. Because I've watched thousands of executives and coached them and I've seen who succeeds and who fails. And some things really stand out that I wish somebody would have shared with me when I was a student. So I'll share that with you. Uh, Honeywell's probably the biggest company that you've heard of, but you don't really know what we do. Most of you will say thermostats. Oh yeah, the little round Honeywell thermostat that you see in homes and buildings, and we are the inventor of the thermostat. That's what got the company started. We're still the biggest player in the heating and cooling industry. It's one-third of one percent of our revenue. 
So that's what people know us for, but it's actually a small, small part of what we do. When I was checking out of a hotel in Romania a couple of years ago, the person checking me out said, oh, honey well, you make honey very good. I don't know. <laughs> we do a lot of things, but honey isn't one of them. So we have uh, uh, four businesses, and there aren't too many companies like that anymore, if you've noticed. The conglomerate is, is viewed as something that's a dinosaur of the past. Uh, companies break up, sell off, spin off things to focus just on their core industry. So we're one of the few big conglomerates left. Uh, we're in the aerospace business. If you get on an airplane made by anybody, anywhere in the world, of any size, there's a better chance than not that we are on board. You've got Honeywell product on that airplane. We do the cockpits, all your electronics and controls. We do engines on the aircraft. Uh, we do the heating and cooling system. We do just about everything on the aircraft except the metal body and the seats. And I, when I say the seats, I have to qualify that because I, I went to visit one of our workshops once and, and you know it's a technical repair thing and I see this big salad bowl sitting over there on a table and I thought, you know, they shouldn't have food in here where they're working on stuff. So I walked over to take a closer look. It was a toilet seat off an aircraft. <laughs> we repair them and it's high margin business. So we do just about everything on the airplane. Uh, we, uh, in our aerospace business, we have a big defense component there. About five billion of it is, is defense. So uh, when you see uh, somebody, and, and not to be a warmonger here, but you know, the way, as long as there are crazy people on the planet, and it seems to have always been that way, no matter what point in history you're at, there are going to be people that you're going to need to protect yourself from. And in the, in the old way of doing it was you find what you thought was your target, and you dropped a whole bunch of bombs on them and hoped you got them, and there was collateral damage. Innocent people, too, would take the hits. Uh, today's technology, there's one company in the world that makes the missile that goes literally through somebody's door frame, and which part of the frame do you want it to go through? Or you shoot it off miles away and it goes exactly where you want it to go. That's us. Doesn't matter what other defense company's name's on there, they're getting the control from us. Doesn't rely on satellite, doesn't use GPS, can't be jammed. Can't tell you how it works. It just has something to do with the shape of the Earth and with physics. Uh, but that's us. And what it does is it, it reduces the chance of, colla of collateral damage of innocent people. And instead, it's just the target. Uh, we do, of course, aircraft cockpits, tank cockpits, things like that. Uh, NASA, everything they've ever put into orbit that's had a human on it since the beginning of NASA, that's our control system on there. And we have never caused a failure of a NASA mission. Uh, so that's us. Um, we've got a chemicals business. Most of you are wearing Honeywell product today. We make the stuff that the, uh, when they put on your clothes, they, they actually dip them in a chemical to make it a little more resilient and a little tougher so it doesn't tear so easily. And so probably 90% of you have our, our product on today and something that you're wearing. If any of you uh, got a prescription pill with a little blister pack, the blister pack, that's us. That comes out of our chemicals business. Um, we do the vast majority of oil and gas refineries around the world. We do their controls and the chemical processes that they use. So we're in places you'd have to look up on a map to see where that country was at. Uh, that's kind of our chemicals group. And then we have our automation control business, which started with the thermostats, but now it's controls to run all kinds of factory processes, uh, large buildings. We sell. Uh, security alarms, fire alarms, smoke detectors. Uh, we don't usually brand at Honeywell. It's other common brands that you know of. And the reason why is if there's a, they're building a new building and they get five people to bid on the, the smoke detector system, uh, three of the brands will be ours that are bidding on it. So we use that to our advantage, kind of a high, medium, low sort of a thing. Uh, we're the world leader in gas detection. We're the world leader in protective personal equipment, like fire departments, the things they wear, the rubber that won't melt with the heat, that sort of thing. Uh, we, we weren't even in the business three years ago, and now we're number one in the world. We've doubled 3M in that space. They've noticed us. Um, Handheld uh, scanning devices, everything from grocery store checkout to the guys that scan things. Uh, we've moved into the number one spot there. We took the business away from Motorola by winning the UPS contract. 
which is huge. We're now bidding on FedEx and think we're gonna unseat them there. So those are some of the things we do. Our automotive business, usually that's a lousy industry to be in because nobody can make any money, the margins are thin. We sell most of the world's turbochargers, whether it's a small vehicle or whether it's a large truck that Caterpillar would make. We do the turbocharger on there, so 25% uh, fuel efficiency because uh, it's reburning exhaust and it makes a small engine much more powerful. If you go to Europe and you get in a car, there's more than a two-thirds chance that our turbocharger is underneath the hood. Uh, and, and we just announced a sale of other brands you may be familiar with, Prestone, Fram, Autolite. We just sold that to a, a private group for a billion dollars. And uh, we also do brake materials. So the reason we're so large, but you never heard of us, is we don't sell to consumers. You know, we don't run advertisements that say, we're Honeywell, buy a cockpit. I mean, it doesn't work like that. Uh, people in the industry absolutely know who Honeywell is, but outside, not so much. Uh, part of, uh, we're in it to make money, and let me just give you a feel, because a lot of you probably didn't do your research on, on Honeywell, but uh, we just did, because I just met with the board of directors two weeks ago, because they do a performance evaluation of my boss, the CEO, and of each of us. And so we had to show them our performance. And uh, in this past year, our stock price outperformed every peer's stock price. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, Danaher, GE, Tyco, any other conglomerate, we beat everybody this year on, on uh, value to shareholders. You go back three years, same thing. You go back five years, we're number three. Uh, you go back eight years, we hold that position. And so we've been pretty darn successful. The S&P 500 and the Dow Jones in the last eight years, we've delivered 3x the value to our shareholders. Our stock price has gone up three times as much as the companies in the S&P 500. Same thing with our market cap. So we've really been putting up some good numbers as a company. Uh, I spent, I've spent 11 years at Honeywell. And what I wanna to talk to you a little bit about is the succeeding in your career. And then I'm gonna talk about the derailers and then we'll open it up to whatever questions you have. So when I think about succeeding in your career, the first thing is, and you're gonna hate this, but you gotta know what you wanna be. You can pick different paths and course correct for about seven years after you're done here. And after that, you're gonna be locked in pretty much. You're pretty much gonna be locked in. If you wanna make a career switch after that, it's gonna come at a price, because nobody's gonna hire you at the wage you'll be making to do something you don't know a whole lot about. So you can, you can kind of jump around paths early on and there are several paths that'll lead to the same place, but at some point you kind of got to lock in. And you have to ask yourself, what do you want out of life? Is it about work? Is it you want to be famous? Is it uh, more family is more important and you just got to work because you got to put money on the table? Uh, you, you've got to really know what it is about yourself that you really want. And here's the catch. I can't tell you how many people come to me at the 15-year mark out of school, and they're very unhappy with where they are. And it's almost too late at that point to make a switch. So it's important to lock in on this. Because if you want to, if, if things outside work are more important to you, it's a mistake to go to work for a hard-charging company because you're gonna work 55 or 60 hours regardless of what job you're in because there's somebody else willing to take your spot. And they're gonna pay you well for what you do, but again, there's somebody willing to take your spot. And so there are certain industries you should gravitate towards if that's what you wanna do. Um, government type roles, and I understand, yes, that you can still get fired and that sort of thing, but it's, I've, I've worked in uh, government roles and so I, I do know the difference. Uh, but that's where you go if you want good benefits, kind of a more secure position. You won't, in most jobs, be asked to work a lot and your chance of getting fired isn't too great. You're also not gonna get rich, absolutely not, because there's a scale and it's capped and pay isn't necessarily for performance and that sort of thing. So there's trade-offs to everything, but you'll be able to spend more time with your family. You won't have to move around at all if you don't want to. And so if that's the case, that's that's the path you wanna go on. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. You just need to know yourself. The rest of my talk though isn't geared towards that sort of a thing. It's geared towards competitive global company where people wanna take you out of what it is that you're doing. It's the same as a competitive sport, the difference between rec league and competitive league. Um, so the rest of my talk is geared more towards the person who says, 
okay, I want to I wanna look back at my career and feel like I got somewhere and, and made something of myself. And I'm not saying that you, it means your family's not important or you don't value them, but there is a price to be paid. You cannot get there without moving around. The, the idea of you can be the mailroom clerk and work your way up to be the CEO is BS in today's world. And you won't be able to name anybody in the last 20 years who's pulled that off at a big company. It doesn't happen. So there's a price to be paid if, if where you want to be is in, a, in an executive position, let's say. Uh, right now, you want to get all you can in terms of your education. Uh, the more breadth and depth you can get, the better off. Uh, I'm not a huge liberal arts fan. Sorry, just not. Uh, I think you're better off uh, having some kind of a specialty, uh, but also get some breadth and know about things other than your area. It doesn't work if your electives, if you're an accounting major and your electives are accounting electives, I don't think that was a good idea. I, I would have branched into other areas because when you get out in business, they want the person who can provide the most value for them and it's depth and breadth. And when you first start your career, it's going to be all about your skill set. What do you know? Can you learn this? Can you get this certification? And then at a point, that becomes absolutely irrelevant. You don't get into management jobs based on being the smartest at your field or the deepest in your field. In fact, it'll keep you from getting into some leadership jobs if you don't also develop the business acumen and the interpersonal piece of it. But it's very important early on to build that competence. So. Uh, the more variety you can get, the better. If you're an accounting major, don't be taking electives in accounting. Take them, take them in other areas. Uh, anything that'll broaden you out and give you a better global awareness. I mentioned you have to be mobile. Uh, we, we don't hire people and put them into leadership roles who aren't mobile. We're trying to pull a trick off that most companies can't, which is be in more than one industry at once and do a darn good job in all of them. Uh, people think you can't do that. Shareholders, it makes them nervous because they think, how can you possibly be good at chemicals and aerospace and automotive and controls and, and yet run it like it's one Honeywell? Uh, the reason our people can do that is we move them around. They get experience in different geographies, different cultures, different industries. They learn a lot about each and the different business models and the different customers. And so, if that's where you want to wind up, you absolutely have to be mobile. And if you have a spouse or significant other, it's better to start having that conversation with them now rather than all of a sudden find out, guess what? The spouse isn't up for it and, and there's going to be doors that are closed to you uh, because mobility is huge. Um, getting results is the most important thing you can do. I didn't set out to be an executive. I honestly never thought about it until I was one level removed from the top job. That was the first time I actually thought about would I want that job. I was just trying to do a good job with what people gave me. Deliver results, figure out how to make it work, how to make things happen, and they'd go, oh, you did a good job with that. Here, let me give you something else. There's two ways people succeed or attempt to succeed in a career. Results and politics. Oh, I'm going to kiss up to the boss. I'm going to drink with them in the bar after hours. Boss golfs, all golf. I'm going to tell them how great they are. They'll do that sort of thing and try to get on the coattails of a boss. And you see it over and over again. There have even been studies done that show that a lot of movement in a lot of businesses, it's like eighth grade all over again. One day you're in the in group, then suddenly you're not, and you don't know what happened because somebody said something about you. And all that stuff is in corporations. And the, it's in big ones and small ones. Big ones have additional bureaucracy, but the politics is in big ones and small ones. But here's the difference. If you take the politics route, it's like a car driving off a cliff. The, your hang time looks great for a while. You're, all, you're getting all kinds of air there, you know, a lot more than the cars that didn't go off the cliff. They're just doing little jumps. But it comes to a fiery crash, and there's no exception to that. And I've seen it again and again and again, where somebody, they try to move up using politics, trying to use their personality, and they're not really delivering the goods. They're just getting in with the right people. And, you know, I'm in the in-group, and, and they'll move up faster than you will. I watched uh, countless peers move up faster than me. They got bigger jobs before I did. They got more pay. They got bigger titles. And I looked at it and I just thought, oh, I can't believe that's how the system works. It always comes to a fiery crash because the person who they've aligned with suddenly falls out of favor, quits, gets fired. And guess what? People in the corporation, the, the, it was like the bully and the little thugs hanging around them. 
they go after the little thugs at that point. And so I don't think politics is the way to go. It's a rapid rise, but it's a short-term strategy. If you go results, you don't get noticed as fast because you're not all flashy and kissing up to people. But they do notice that you're delivering results. And when they're picking people to be on their team, they want you because they know you're going to deliver results. It's a little quieter. It's not quite the rapid rise. But in the end, that's what it's all about. And then when you work for someone like I do, where I'm in the Northeast, it's, it's you know, all the Ivy League schools and everything else. But guess what? My boss, his dad was a mechanic that owned a garage, and he went to the new University of New Hampshire. And he doesn't give a rip if you're from Harvard or Yale or whatever. He cares about what you get done. So it's all about the results. I would encourage you to take that path and don't get caught up in the, the politics of things. And the other thing he likes to say is, Wall Street doesn't measure us on effort. You get no credit for effort. So as much as we, you know, everybody's a winner, every kid's a winner kind of a thing, that sort of thing. Well, I'm sorry, but if you miss what you were supposed to do by one penny, your stock price gets hammered, your share owners are unhappy, they start voting against your board, all kinds of bad stuff can happen. And so it, it really, it's about results. Uh, the next thing I would say, no matter what discipline you're in, marketing, accounting, finance, it doesn't matter, uh, you have to have business acumen, including in human resources. So I took, I took significant finance and accounting classes when I was here, as well as HR, because I couldn't decide which, which one to go into. I was actually better at the finance and the accounting, but I, I liked aspects of HR. And at the time, my professors said, no offense to current professors, they're tired of hearing this, but uh, the finance ones were going, what are you doing? I mean, uh, HR, that's touchy-feely, squishy stuff. You can't make any money. What are you doing? And the HR ones were going, what are you doing with the finance and accounting stuff? You're going to be a bean counter. You're going to be stuck in the back room somewhere crunching numbers and you know, not adding any, any real value. And, and nobody saw any value in it. It turned out to be lucky that I did that because what I became then was an HR person that can read a balance sheet, an income statement. I know what went into it. I know what working capital turns is, and, and I can couch everything like that. No matter what your discipline is, even if, if you're marketing, if you don't understand the financials, you're going to be capped in your career. Whether you're HR, no matter what you are, you've got to understand how a business makes money. If I run into one of our employees and, you know, the typical elevator speech, and you get in there and you say, so which one of our products has the highest margin on it? Some people know like that. Other people are like, oh, I think it's this. Uh, it's probably that. Yeah, we seem to sell a lot of those. That sort of an answer. Or what do we lose money on? Or do we make or lose money on it? Or how does, is this a razor, razor blade model? Or do you have to make all the money up front? What kind of tails on it? You got to learn those kind of things no matter what your specialty is if you want to be able to move up. Because as you get onto a leadership team and get higher and higher, they expect you to participate in that stuff. There's a reason they gave me global procurement. How many HR people do you know that have procurement? There probably is one, I just haven't met them. But that's because the boss said, you know what, I like what you've done here, I think you can do a good job with this. I'm gonna add this on to your, to your duties. So no matter what you're in, you gotta be able to speak the language of the CEO. If not, it's like you speak English and everybody speaks Italian and they don't speak any English and you're trying to convince them of something. If you don't have business acumen, you're gonna struggle. So you do everything you can to get it. If you read the Wall Street Journal, you're a step ahead of where I was at. You know, you look down that left column and you can pick up quickly what's going on in the world. But you're not going to get business acumen if all you're reading is this company bought this company, this one sold this one, this one came in short on earnings, this one's trying to push into China. If, if that's all you're getting, then you're just, you're going to be good at trivia, I guess. <laughs> you got all these facts in your head. But instead, you need to be going, why, why, why? Why did they buy this company? Was that a good decision or not? Did they overpay for this? Is there going to be a cultural clash there? Who's in charge and why are they in charge? If you start asking those kind of questions and then you follow what happens, that's how you build business acumen. A lot of small business people fail, as you know, 9 out of 10 or probably higher than that. But uh, if th those who succeed... They have business acumen. They're very attuned to things like cash flow. A lot of companies care about earnings. Not as important as cash flow. We focused on cash flow. That's the reason we have 2x the cash that our peers do. That's why we've made some great acquisitions. We had the money to do it, and they were, frankly, out of the game because their money was tied up in inventory and accounts receivable, and they weren't paying much attention to it. Had a great income. Anybody remember Enron? 
They had, they had great income, but what they didn't have was cash flow. It wasn't real. The sales weren't real. They weren't coming in. So it's more important. But see, you don't know that sort of stuff when you're first starting out. Like you're like, cash, what does that matter? That's like an afterthought, somebody counting the money. So no matter what your discipline is, you want to build your business acumen. And then this one, all this sounds easy, but it's harder to put into play. What keeps your boss awake at night? You wouldn't believe how many people don't even think of that. And they come up with solutions to things that the boss doesn't care about or doesn't think is a problem. Quick example from the HR world. I had a woman who she loved doing learning and training and development type stuff. And so she designed this big 100-page training program and took it into her boss, the president of business, and said, look at this. This is great. Everybody's going to love it. It's going to be all wonderful. And the boss wasn't interested. And she's devastated, and she's crying in my office. I'm not being appreciated. This is what I'm good at. It's, I know this is what they need, blah, 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 blah. And, and, uh, and then about uh, two months later, one of her peers, who really isn't a training person at all, uh, came up with a three-page training program, and everybody wanted a copy. And the boss loved it, and everybody wanted it. And you're looking at it, and you're going, well, okay, three pages was better than 100. That's a good starter. But what the real difference was is, who asked for this? Well, in the first case, nobody. This was just this person who thought that this is what I really like to do, and this is going to be good for everybody, so I'm going to push my solution out there. The other person literally asked the question I just said to their boss. They said, so what keeps you awake at night? And the boss said, it's these two things. This is what I worry about. So he went back and thought about it, and he thought, you know what? There's a training solution that will actually solve part of this. And that's why they, it was a poll kind of a thing. But too many people, when they go into their career, they think it's all about their expertise and how well they can do something and, and, and what the company needs to do to do better. Instead of saying, what is it the company's most worried about and how can I help be part of that solution? And then the last one on succeeding in your career is you want to be someone who raises issues and solves issues. Sounds very easy, but people struggle to do both. I can't tell you how many people I've had come to me and say, I'm underappreciated at my company. I'm the only one that can see 20 problems with what it is they're trying to do. The other people can only think of three or four on their own. I'm the smartest person in the room is kind of what they're telling me. And uh, I, I can see all these problems and everything they're trying to do is the wrong thing to do because we tried it 10 years ago and it didn't work. And I'm not getting moved ahead. I'm not getting promoted. My bosses don't like me. And, you're sitting there thinking, okay, I don't think I'd want you on my team either. I mean, who wants to be with somebody who's always coming up with 20 ways you can't do something instead of one way maybe that you could? On the other hand, you don't want someone who just sits there and goes, okay, boss, yeah, that's a great idea. I've never heard such a good idea. And then they're out at the water cooler going, can you believe that? Can you believe what he's going to do? I mean, there are people that, that do that. And this may or may not surprise you, but when I got the job I'm in, I gathered my team together and I said, okay, I'm going to make this real easy for everybody. We've had a problem with honesty, especially in the corporate group, trying to make everything shine and look better than it really is and not admit what's going on. And I said, that ends today. The first one of you, and I like you guys, but the first one of you who lies to me or lies to each other, I'm going to hang your body on a post. I'm going, to, I'm going to terminate your employment. I don't care who you are and where you're at in our rating system. I'm going to end your employment. I'm serious about this honesty thing. And everybody's going, oh my gosh, you know. And, and I really thought I was going to have to hang bodies on the post over the honesty thing because it was so rampant. But just knowing that, there was an instant, instant change on that. And um, I also told him, I said, here's the deal. We're going to discuss strategy that's going to affect 130,000 people in 120 countries. I need you to have an opinion, and I need you to express that opinion. And I don't care if nobody in the room agrees with you. And I don't care if it's the opposite of my idea. And you're going to be all nervous at first because you're going to think, oh, if I disagree with the boss, he's going to ding me on my bonus and that sort of thing. And you'll come to realize I will never do that. It is safe to do that, to take me on or to take the others on. And let's have a big discussion over what's the right way to do this thing. Now, I said, you don't need to be rude about it. Like, well, that's the stupidest thing I ever... I mean, you can still get your idea across without being personally rude. But I expect you to say something. And if you don't say something, and I hear later that you thought that all along but didn't say it, I will let you go that day. So you have to speak up. I need people that will speak up. 
And I said, now, once the decision's been made, the debate's over, and I said, some decisions I won't really care too much about, and I'll, you guys will vote on it, and we'll go with a majority vote. That's the direction we'll, we'll go. Uh, others, it'll be unanimous. And then other times, you guys will all want to do it one way, and I'll say, sorry, I'm using my veto power. We're not going to do it that way. It doesn't matter how the decision got made, unanimous, just the boss, somewhere in between. You've got to support it at that point. It's like trying to, I, I used this example once in Europe, but trying to sneak George Washington across the, across the river, and you've got to figure out when are we going to meet, how many people in the boat, what cadence are you going to row on, and you can have a big argument ahead of time to get that right. By the way, I said it in the UK, and somebody raised their hand and said, we were actually hoping George didn't make it across the river. <laughs> so I had to work on the cultural sensitivity. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you picture that. You can't get there at 6 in the morning, and one guy wanted to row on a cadence of 5, and you've agreed on 3. That's what you're going to do. And they're, they don't care. They're right. They think they're right. The rest of you are wrong. They're going to row on a cadence of 5. That's going to be a problem, getting your boat across the river. In fact, I could take average athletes, and I can beat world-class rowers across the river. If they can't agree on how they're going to do it, we're going to beat them across the river. And so it's very important, and that sounds really easy when I say it, but it's really hard because it takes courage to say, I don't agree with this, or I have an issue with this. And not every culture is going to be that open to that either. But if you're going to do things right, you've got to be able to have that kind of an environment. And so I'd say you have to have the courage to be able to raise issues, but you can't be the moaner. You can't be the one that's always thinking of how something won't work and you're smarter than everybody else. You've got to have some solutions, too. You've got to be able to think of how do I solve it? Because think about it. If you had somebody working for you and it was your personal money, do you want the person who helps you solve your problem or do you want the person who tells you all the reasons you can't do it? It's legal. It's an accounting practice. Blah, blah, blah. You know, that's not what you want. So in terms of succeeding in your career, those are the things I'd focus on. Now I'm going to fast forward and say, so why do people get fired? Once you're beyond the first seven or ten years, they hardly ever get fired for skill set or, or just incompetence. People use the word a lot, but when you ask them to describe what do they mean by somebody who's incompetent, it's not their knowledge and their skills that were the issue. It's attitude. And I'd go so far as to say I can think of a handful of executives at our company that were fired for um, just incompetence. The rest of them, it's attitude. And you want to keep this in mind because there will come a point in each of your careers where you don't agree with what's happening at the company you're at. You're going to be convinced it's wrong. You're going to be convinced it's wrong because you've seen it before, eight years ago, and it didn't work, and so it's not going to work now. You know it's wrong because you don't have faith in the people that are making that decision. And what you do at that point is going to determine the rest of your career there at the company. And keep in mind what I just talked about, about you've got to raise issues and concerns, but you've got to be part of solving the problem. And the way I would describe it is... Um, is uh, embracing and driving change. And, and I apologize to a few of you that were in earlier and already heard this, but how I describe it to people is I say it's like this. You're on the beach, and you went there to have a nice day, sun, swim, play. You look out, and here comes a tsunami-sized wave rolling in. And so you look at it and go, well, what's that? Wait a minute. That isn't what I signed up for. That's not right. That wave should not be that high. I'm sure that that's not. All my friends and relatives agree, too. That wave shouldn't be here on the beach. It's big, and it's not right. And, and, there, and now you've got a choice. You can either stand out there and keep doing that, keep telling everybody in the company how this is the wrong direction, this is the wrong thing, it's a wrong wave. Wave, I, I command you to stop. You might even be right. That wave isn't, shouldn't be on the beach. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to get pounded into the sand. That thing is going to hit you. It's probably going to take you out. It'll take you out of your career and out of the company. You're going to get pounded in the sand. You had zero influence on that wave or on anybody around you. All you did was this, I defy, it's wrong, you're all and you're going to get pounded into the sand. And you didn't, you didn't stop it, you didn't change it, you didn't help anybody else. And you'd be surprised at how many people do that. Even people that are pretty good with change and then one comes along they don't like. No, what are your other choices? You can go, huh, this isn't what I signed up for. This is wrong. I'm out of here. I'm off this beach. I'm going to another beach where the waters are calm. 
And you can do that once, maybe twice in your career, where you really don't like what's going on at that company. You don't like the direction of management. And you can, and in some cases, should leave, because something unethical is going on, blah, blah, blah. If you tell me that happened at your last three or four companies, I will not hire you. Because that, what are you going to do? You're going to think we're unethical, too. The first time there's a change or something you've got to embrace, you're going to be going, oh, no, 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 no. Because you've done it at all the other companies. You always run from everything. Like I said, it's okay once or twice. But ever, to, to say that every time that you're going to run from things, I mean, that's like, that's like being the ninth wife or husband of somebody and saying, oh, I'm sure it'll work out. Oh, those other eight, that, that was different. You know, I'm, I, I'm, different. I'm sure it'll work out. It'll be okay. That's what happens if you hire someone who ran from the management of their company every time. Uh, the third choice you have is to look at it and say, okay, not what I signed up for. Maybe I don't think this is the right thing, but guess what? It's inevitable. The company is going to centralize or decentralize or whatever. And so I don't want to run off the beach, nor do I want to get pounded into the sand. So where's my surfboard? How can I figure out where I'm going to ride this thing? And I'm actually going to be able to influence and be a part of it and survive it. And that sounds like an easy example, but I can't tell you how many hundreds of people I've seen lose their job over their inability to do that to be able to embrace a change that's coming and to be a part of it. So that's the first career de derailer. Uh, the second one, not surprisingly, is courage. So we were doing a business acumen leadership training for all of our HR people. And they were asked a question and, and as part of a workshop thing. And the question was, do you believe if you um, if you stand up for something or cause a commotion or object to something, do you, do you get punished in this company or do you get rewarded in our company? And half of the people said, oh yeah, you get punished. You get fired. I know people that got fired. You get fired for doing that sort of thing. And the other half of the people said, no, you get rewarded. And so I thought, isn't this interesting? And this is at a company where we push performance culture. And I thought, isn't it interesting the divide in the HR people? And I thought about it, and I thought about it. And then I thought, OK, who was in which camp there? And then I went and looked at their ratings. Guess what? The people, we use a nine block grid to rate people on results and behaviors. 50% of people are in the middle. Almost all the people in the middle or in one of the bad boxes were the people that said you get fired if you stand up and exhibit courage. The people in the good boxes were all the people that go, what are you talking about? And the interesting thing is when I challenged the people that said you get fired, I said, who's gotten fired for standing up to something? They couldn't come up with names. Finally, they came up with, when I said, gee, you guys can't come up with any names, but yeah, you believe this would happen? They came up with one or two names, and I said, Trust me, they didn't get fired. I know about that one, and it wasn't, and I can't share with you what they did, but it's not, it's not that. But isn't that interesting? At some point in your career, you make a choice on courage, and you either decide you're going to take some chances and exhibit courage and stay true to what you know is right and share your opinion, and you're going to get ahead because of it. Or you're going to say, oh, that's dangerous. Just keep your head down. Don't cause any trouble. Just do a good job, and your career is going to stagnate. I just thought that was a very interesting observation. Uh, another thing I would share is um, courage to drive change. So here comes the Mark James milkshake theory. I always get this won't you won't see this in a Harvard business case, but I always get asked. Uh, I get I get attributed with driving a lot of change at our company. People go, well, how do you do it? And here's where the milkshake theory comes in. Um, if you've got a brand new car, nice new leather seats, new, some, got that new car smell, and somebody in the back seat's got a milkshake, and you're going down the road, and you hit a little bump, and stuff spills out of the milkshake, what happens in the car? Everybody's, oh, yeah, get them some napkins and wipe it up, and everybody's trying to help out. Like, it's a little milkshake thing, and everybody's, it's this huge event. It's the main event in the car. Okay, same situation, going down a road, milkshake in the back, swerve to miss hitting a cow or something, and you're just trying to keep the car from rolling. Stuff's going everywhere. The whole milkshake's got, you know, and people are books and papers. And everybody. Anybody talking about the milkshake? <laughs> Nobody is. 
And, and that's a lot of how I've driven change. It's, it, people will back away from, try, oh, everybody's going to get mad. They're going to get mad. Well, let's just put this one little thing, one little change forward and see how it goes. And it works like the milkshake. You put that one little change forward and everybody mobilizes to kill it, you know, and destroy. And how dare you do this? You can't do this. Where if you're rolling a whole bunch of changes, they, they just focus on the big one or two things and the other stuff just kind of slides right through. And so rather than be fearful of driving things, that's how I've done it. I'm going to share one other thing on the courage. So I had a guy who was getting fired, and he was getting fired because he was the finance person responsible for setting the pricing on a big billion-dollar deal that we'd bid on. And he set the pricing too low. And so we were wind up producing it and losing money every time we got one made. And so it's like, okay, you know, who did this? Well, he said, it's not my fault because I knew the pricing was bad. And I was in this meeting where the superiors came down and said, hey, are everybody okay? Anybody have any problem? And he didn't say anything. And he was getting fired for not saying anything because he was primarily responsible. He should have said, we're setting the pricing too low. And he goes, but I couldn't because I told my boss the day before. And he said, don't you dare say something like that. This is where I want the pricing at. So he said, so what could I do? You know? And he said, there's nothing I could do. And I said, uh, not exactly. That's not true. Don't you also have a finance boss? Don't they also have a, a line there to you? Why didn't you go to your finance boss and say, look, I'm in a spot here. Here's the deal. We're setting this too low. My boss has said, don't, don't change it. I need your help, but in a way that doesn't throw me under the bus. How easy would that have been? And this higher level CFO could have said, you know, I don't think that's the right pricing. And here's why I don't think that's the right. And the whole thing would have come out and would have been resolved. But because they felt like, oh, I'm between a rock and a hard place and had no courage, it winds up costing them their, their job. So you got to have courage. Courage doesn't mean be rude to everybody and be the one naysayer all the time. That's not what I'm saying. But it's, it's when you know, when you have a different opinion, you need to be able to air that. And be smart about it. Sometimes you don't do it in a public setting. Sometimes you do it in a private setting. I would, I would never tell my boss he was wrong about something in front of our leadership team. Oh, hey, you're wrong. You know, I do tell him in private. I do tell him in private. Um, another derailer is, and this is a big one, and you guys are going to think it's nothing. But it's actually right up there with results. The two biggest reasons executives lose their job. One is not delivering results. The other is lack of self-awareness. And my, my boss would tell you the same thing. He thinks that's the biggest thing. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that you know what you're good at and what you're not good at. That means that uh, you know what you know and you know what you don't know. And I've learned when I interview people, I have a good track record at being able to pick who will succeed and who won't. In fact, so much so that when I first got this job and I disagreed on four candidates with my boss and with the rest of the executive team where I said, these guys aren't going to work out. They'll be gone within a year. You'll fire them or they'll quit. And everybody else, oh, they're great. Look at this. They're from Harvard and blah, blah, blah. And they worked at this company and that company. and They hired them anyway, and I was right on all four. And so at that point, my boss said, you know what, I don't know how you're doing it, but you got a good track record and I'm going to stick with it until you prove otherwise. And I've had multiple situations where everybody but me wanted to hire somebody or promote someone. And I'm the only one that said no. And every time he has not hired them or has not promoted them. All right. And I'm using self-awareness to make that assessment. And I'll give you an example of a question that I use. I say, uh, if I got all your bosses together in a room and I ask them what two things you're not good at, what would they say? So they give me a couple answers and I say, okay, now let's get your peers in a room. What, what two things do they think you could be a better peer by changing? Okay, now let's go to the people who work for you. What would your subordinates say? What are two things? And I've got a couple other questions too where I'm basically asking for weaknesses. Well, guess what? Just like all of you that have done interviewing, you got one real doozer, right? That's the one you're going to use. You practiced it on your significant other and your body, and your weakness is going to be, I work too hard. Yeah, so that's it. It's work-life balance. You know, I'm just such a hard worker. By the way, if you do that one to me, I'll go, oh, why is, is that a problem? Do you burn out easily? What? But, you know, they give me a real good one. And then number two, that's the alternate. That's the one they were thinking about using, but decided on the other one. Now we get to number three. Uh-oh. 
that's deep for some people. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I'm comfortable with silence. I'll sit there and I won't say anything. I'll just wait for the answer and not let them off the question. And I have peop some people that, I've, I have had some people that can't come up with anything they could get better at. 20 year career and they can't think of one mistake they've ever made one thing they could have gotten better at, or they can only think of one or two, like I work too hard and I need to learn more about the job. Do you wanna work for that person? They're doing one of two things. They're lying to me because they're afraid to tell what their real weakness is, afraid I'm not gonna give them the job, so they've chosen to lie. Or they really don't think they have them. And nobody's perfect. Okay, there may have been one person at one time who was, but the rest of us, nobody here today is, is perfect. And they, don't, they can't think of anything. Been working 20 years, can't think of a thing I could have been done, done better. Been playing sports for 10 years and I can't think of one play I would have run differently. I mean, how real is that? Do you wanna work for that person? Guess whose fault it's gonna be when something goes wrong? Not gonna be the boss's fault, gonna be your fault. Um, and so what I've learned is if we ever hire those people, they always fail because you put them on a big project and it's important and you ask how it's going, do you think you're gonna get an honest answer? Oh, they just lied to get the job. But now they'll tell you the answer even though it reflects poorly on them. And can cost, they're gonna to lie to you about how things are going and what's going on. Or they think they're perfect. And so self-awareness is a huge deal. And so sometimes when you confront someone, more often than not they'll say, no one's ever told me that before. Um, and, and they'll say, well, I, I, I disagree, I'm going to another company, good, here's our competitor, I hope you go to them, because I would love to compete against you. I don't, I'm not quite that blatant, but I do, I do think that. Um, when people that are that just don't tell me a thing, they're, you're wrong, blah, 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 I, I really do hope they land at the competition, because that's who I'd rather compete against. Um, but uh, other people will go, oh my gosh, I'm shocked. I can't believe that. Nobody, tell me more about it. I gotta understand this. Even if it's not reality, it's perceptions reality. I gotta figure out how to fix it. How do I fix it kind of a thing. Those are the kind of people you want as leaders. The people that are reflective, that they do a post game on everything they do. Yeah, it went pretty well overall, but if I had it again, I'd have changed this and I'd change this and here's something I learned from it. Those are the people you wanna hire into leadership roles. Um, so we got two more, being collaborative. So we come from a kind of a, we're, we're not a finesse company. We're more of a, somebody the other day told me that we're a, we're a full contact sport company. Uh, it's pretty much hard hitting in your face, deliver results, but guess what? If nobody wants to work with you, we, we can't use you. If you're delivering the results, but your behaviors are bad, We'll keep you for a while, we'll give you another day to live, and we'll tell you what's wrong with your behaviors, and we'll tell you that this is gonna stop you from moving ahead if you don't get this fixed. Because yeah, you're getting results, but you're like the guy at the parade that wants the candy they throw, and you're throwing elbows at little kids in their nose on the way there. It's like, get the candy, but don't elbow the little kids. Same thing in work, it's like, get it done, but don't, don't kill everybody here. But, but a lot of companies go the opposite. They hire collaborative, nice people who can't get diddly squat done. Because as soon as they hit a shut door, they don't know how to open the door. And so we're not interested in people who are nice people, make great neighbors, hope they're my neighbors, but they won't get things done for you. On the other hand, we can't just have people that get results and have bad behaviors. So you've gotta be driven and collaborative. Sounds really easy, it's really hard to do, especially when you get people who want nothing to do with what it is you're trying to push. What you do at that point makes all the difference. Do you give up? Do you throw a two-year-old temper tantrum? You know, what do you do to, to move your thing forward? And the last one is what I'd call management operating system. Now, what I mean by that is, how do you know that everything you're responsible for is going okay? If I was to ask, I've asked audiences before, what's the thing you hate most in a boss? What characteristic or trait? Guess what's always number one or number two that comes out of the audience? Starts with an M. <laughs> micromanagement. I don't want to be micromanaged. 
That's what everybody says all the time. Every audience, even in my company, that's what happens. I don't want to be micromanaged. Now, there is such thing as a micromanager, somebody who's telling you every little way to do everything, and they're checking every 30 minutes, and it's like, really, I got it. I'm okay. Don't. But when it comes to people complaining in my office, because I'm who you go to when you're unhappy about something, I've probably had hundreds, if not a thousand or more people in my office in my career. How many times has their complaint been, I'm being micromanaged? I need one hand to count that number. So even though in large audiences everybody says, I don't want to be micromanaged, that's not what they're complaining about. You know what they are complaining about? By the hundreds? The exact opposite. My boss doesn't know what I'm doing, doesn't understand what I'm doing, hasn't visited my site, canceled my review on, on how the project was going, um, doesn't do one-on-ones with me, doesn't hold a staff meeting regularly. That's what they're complaining about. It's not being micromanaged, it's the opposite. It's like a lack of, and why is that? Well, if you're a good performer you, you, and you've been knocking a ball out of the park, you want everybody to see the film. Look how far I hit that one. Look at this, I got this done, I got that done. And the boss doesn't care, doesn't have a meeting, doesn't have a review, cancels it. You're disappointed. You're like, hey, I had a good story to share here and now I don't share it. Who hates having a review on what they're doing? The poor performer because they don't have a good story. They're gonna have a picture of hitting the ball or dribbles back to the pitcher kind of a thing, not out of the park. They do not wanna have a review. And if you're responsible for stuff and you say, I just hire good people and then I stand back, get out of their way, give them autonomy, uh, let them self-direct work teams, let them perform, you will get fired and more than once. Because even if you think you've hired good people, again, no one's perfect. And the bigger your organization, the more people that you're gonna have that were mishires, you just don't know it yet. And they're gonna disappoint you in a big way. It's like if you're trying to put on a theatrical play and you're responsible for the whole thing, how do you know they're gonna be ready on opening day? If you have an attitude of, I've just hired good people, I have a good manager, stage manager, and a good director, and I have good actors, and good people with the scenery, and I'm sure it's all gonna to come together all right. You know, they've done other plays and it turned out okay. Uh, you're going to have a surprise on opening night sooner or later. They're not going to be ready to go. So maybe, you know, you don't want to micromanage them, so you'll call up on the phone and go, hey, how's it going? Are we ready for opening night? Oh, yeah, it's going pretty good. We've had a few things come up, but we got a handle on it. It's all good, you know, it's all right. If you say, oh, I want to come visit and look. Yeah, why don't you, we'll have lunch and, you know, they just kind of want to get you in, tell you happy stuff and get you out sort of a thing. What you really should be doing is on a regular basis showing up announced and unannounced and saying, where's the scenery? Where's the scenery? Oh, the, the guy, the two guys quit and the other one didn't show up today. Okay, what were we gonna do about it? Well, uh, we're hoping the one guy comes in and I mean, that's, the, that's what you're getting where you could say, no, 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 no. Let me help you out here. I, I just authorized you to get three more people. We need them here by tomorrow. I'm gonna stop back in and, and see that they're here. Now, what are the other issues you're having? And you look around and you find things. Uh, I'm going to open it to questions in a minute, but I'll give you a couple quick examples to illustrate it. Um, one is we moved some, well, I'll tell this one first. So I'm in a, I'm in a meeting with, I'm in the Aero Aerospace Division, and we've got a new president, and he's come over from the automotive group. And so he's saying, I don't get why we make all these metal devices here in Phoenix. Why don't we make them in Mexico where we could do it a lot cheaper? And there were 20 people in the room, and they'd been experts in this for 20 to 30 years. And it was show and tell. They had the parts there, the actual parts you could look at and show around. There's all this complex drilling and machining being done. And you're looking at it, and you're going, wow, how do you even get an angle to put threads in there? And it's got to be within certain tolerances, 0.001 of something. And, you know, it looks complex, and they got a great slideshow, great pictures, 40-page deck. And you go through this whole thing, and they're saying, see, this is so complicated, you couldn't possibly have... People in Mexico do it. They're not, they're not smart enough. They don't have the background, blah, 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 blah. Sounds all great. Well, then my boss goes, oh, let's walk over to the factory. I want to see somebody make this. Well, why do you need to do that? We got all the parts here and we got the, no, no, no. I want to I see it made. 
And so we walk over there, and I'm not exaggerating here. We walk over, and there's one guy there, and there's a machine about as long as this first row of chairs, complicated machine. I'm sure it took a lot of effort to design and build it. And the operator takes a chunk of metal, opens the lid, puts the chunk in, clamps it down, closes the lid, push the big green button over here. There's a green one and a red one. Push the big green button, stand back for about 10 minutes. It makes all the complicated angles and drillings and cuts and blah, blah, blah. Oh, time's up. Open up the door, take it out, take it over to another machine designed by engineers, set it in, it checks the tolerances and either good to go or Oop, got a problem here. And if it's the machine's out of tolerance, gets on the phone and calls the, the manufacturing engineer to come over and fix it. And you're looking at this and, and I'm going, hey, I'm the HR guy and I think I can make these things right now. <laughs> so, so this idea of what looked like a complex product really wasn't. Uh, another example, and I don't mean to, I guess I'm picking on the same business here, but uh, we moved some things from the US down to one of the Mexico facilities. Uh, and uh, we were having all kinds of problems with throughput yield and you know the parts weren't being made right and it was taking way, way too long. And the biggest problem is it was taking way too long. And so we're trying to figure it out. We're using all kinds of statistics and sending people in to look at it. Why is it taking them like twice as long to make everything in Mexico as what we were making in the US? And what do you think the people in the US told us the reason was? Yeah, we're good. We're, and by the way, this isn't a US thing. People in Germany think this. People in Japan think this. Honestly, people in China think that. It, it, it's, there's something about, well, we're the experts. We're the, no one else could possibly do this. And so they're, they're sitting there saying, well, it's because you know, we told you they wouldn't be able to do it. The only solution is to bring it back here where we can do it and make it happen. And so my boss says, you know what? This won't surprise you. Let me go watch them make it. And he goes down there, and, and the, guy, the guy, hey, how are you doing? You know, good to meet you, Juan, and here's the deal. And he, he takes these two pieces he's got to put together, and he puts some glue, solvent on first, and then some glue on the thing. And then he gets out four or five screws and puts those in, and then a couple of clamp things on it. And so he does this process, and he's following these orders he's gotten of how you, how you do it. And so then my boss goes, let me go see it back in the US. See, the, see them making the same thing because we we're still making it there. And the guys were all saying, oh, you got to bring it back. We go back there and the guy, same part. The guy takes it, puts it together, puts two screws in it and sends it on its way. <laughs> My boss is going, where's the glue? Where's the sealant? Where's the extra clamps? You know, blah, blah, blah. And you know what the answer was? Well, we're experts at doing this, but we knew these other guys aren't. And so we want to make sure this thing doesn't come apart. And so they built in all those extra steps. And so you don't learn stuff like that unless you're actually going to go out and see it. It gets to that whole management operating system. You can't be so worried about offending people that you're micromanaging. Your good performers want to tell you what a good job they're doing. So with that, I'd open it up to your questions or anything that you'd like to talk about or hear about. Yes. I have a question. What would you recommend when you're dealing with poor performers when termination is not an option? Okay, so the question is how do we deal with poor performers when termination isn't an option? Um, I know you're I know you're gonna be surprised, but with very rare exceptions, termination is an option. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what and by the way, this is gonna sound funny too, but the more people a company fires, the less likely they are to lose a lawsuit for firing people. I worked at a place that didn't fire anybody, and we got sued every time we tried to do it and wound up settling. And you know why? Because when you finally have had it with somebody, and you've had it, and you've had it, and they killed not two people, but ten people, so we finally got to let them go kind of thing, well then they go, oh, well, but uh, it's a female, and she's from a certain race, why didn't you do that to any of the white males? And you got a problem because you can't point to anybody. You, you just did it to her. All of a sudden, you got a problem. Where a company that fires a lot of people, there's always somebody for a comparison. Oh, yeah, well, we fired this one. We fired 10 guys <laughs> 20 years old you know, for doing the same thing. I, I'm being dead serious about it. And so uh, it does cost you a lot in certain countries, especially in Europe. It's not uncommon, to, no matter what the level a person is, to pay two or three years of severance pay if you want to move them out. But think about what you're doing to the other people there around. 
You're going to keep paying them for another 10 or 15 years. They're going to poison everybody around them. Other people are going to pick up their work. You're going to hire extra people to do the work that they're not doing. You're going to demoralize the whole group. They're looking at you going, how come they don't do something about this person? And so you're always better stepping up and addressing it. Um, another interesting fact, I have yet, I'm sure it's possible, but I have yet to have someone say to me, I fired that person too fast, I think. You know, I should have given them another chance. I'd never hear anybody say that. Guess what I do here? Oh. And then after they were gone, it's like, oh my gosh, we discovered all this other stuff, and I should have done this two years ago. I've been guilty of the same thing myself, where I hung on to someone, thought they could do well. Uh, when I first started out, I'm all about you know management by walking around and be a good people manager, and I got to manage three people and six people and 12 people, and it worked good, and they liked working for me, and everybody performed better. So I thought, hey, I'm pretty good at this. And then I got 75 people in the next job. It's like, okay, I can't quite do it the same, but I'm a good people manager. I can do the same thing with everybody. And so I started, I started up in everybody's game saying, well, here's how you do it. And I had the line management coming back to me going, I've known so-and-so for 15 years, never seen them perform like this. This is outstanding. So I'm thinking, not bad, you know, it's, it's all working. And then I went to my next job. And I'd made B players into A players, C players into B players, D players into C players. I called back and I said, how's so-and-so doing? How's so-and-so doing? How's so-and-so doing? Guess what? The two people that were B plus, A minus already that I made into an A player, they still had their A game on. Everybody else, without exception, like a rubber band, went back to what they were as soon as I was gone and they replaced me with someone that wasn't really too driven. Everybody went back to what they were. And I thought, okay, there's a lesson here. You can't fix everybody. There's a lesson here to be learned. Most managers come into a job and they make a mistake. There's people that are thrilled you're there. Oh, I can't thank heavens you're here. You spend a lot of time with them because they say nice things about you. It's like reading your own good reviews. Oh, yeah, yeah, I gotta, I gotta hear it again and get more praise. And, spend, and then there's the people who hate that you're there, don't think you should have gotten the job, don't like your view on things. And you spend time with them trying to convince them otherwise. Oh, no, really? I can just, I'll tap into your knowledge and, and value and respect you. And then the people in the middle, you're just kind of hoping it works out for them. You're trying to give them some attention, but you're busy with the people on the ends. That's, that's what I was doing. That's exactly the wrong way to manage a new work group. The, the way you should do it is you come in and the people who love you and they're glad you're there, you already got them. They're going to love what you do. Don't spend time with them. I mean, don't ignore them, but don't, you, know, you don't need to spend time there. You already got them. These people over here that are really upset, let them go. Within the first week, let them go. Because if you don't, you'll find out that uh, one of them, the spouse has an illness and they've got a lot of kids and they're really a nice person and you wind up hanging on and trying to fix them and you'll never win them over. You'll never, never win them over. Where you should be spending all, it's like get rid of these people. You already got these people. Spend your time in the middle group and get them to one side or the other. They're either on the bus with you and want to help or they're not. But too many people do it the other way and it's a mistake and you hang on to people. And when I went into my next job, my boss said, congratulations, you get 180 people to manage. You got the worst HR team in the company. Go get them. You know, the gate goes down and I run in. And uh, I had 16 direct reports, and I fired or they quit under pressure, 12 of them. And by the way, it should have been 13, but uh, I did the first one on day one. Didn't even know I was going to do it. I sat down, and the woman, uh, at the time, GE was trying to buy the company, and the woman was my OD person. She's going to advise me on driving cultural change and organizational design and all that. And she goes, you know, I hate uh, Allied Signal, which is who bought Honeywell, but they kept the Honeywell name. I hate them. They do everything wrong. I hate GE, who's trying to buy us. They do everything wrong. And she literally said, I don't know how you got the job, because two of the other people on the slate have twice your experience. And I'm thinking, and this is going to be my... OD advisor, and so I said, okay, understand, I'll have your package ready in the morning. No, 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 I didn't quit. No, you did. You hate everything your company is, everything it's going to be, and you don't think I should be the boss. I need somebody else in the OD role. So then immediately I had our female CFO coming over asking me why I didn't like women. <laughs> and I said, be patient. There will be more. And unfortunately, though, the next one was also female. And she came back in again. I knew it. 
And I said, I'll get to the guys, I'll get to the guys. But, uh, but uh, the, the, so the lessons from that, my boss didn't come back and go, oh, you, you did the best job, you got the best team. But he came back and took four of my people the next year for other parts of the business. So I took that as not bad. But even I, in that scenario, held on to one person that I shouldn't have. Really nice guy, you give him feedback, and he, oh, here's my 40-step action plan to improve, you know, he respond. But, but he was kind of a B-minus player. And I held on to him for two years. And I, I was a little nervous about letting him go because I had the Attila the Hun thing from letting the other 12 go. And I thought everybody really liked him. And then finally, I just thought, okay, I can't do this anymore. He's hurting the business too much. And I let him go. And my best people came into me and said, it's about time. We couldn't believe you held on to him. I'm like, how come nobody said anything? I mean, that's just how the workplace works. And the other thing on performers is uh, whatever you, your weakest performer that you tolerate, you just set the bar for the entire team, whether you intended to do it or not. Because they all know who the weakest person is. Any team of 10 people, I interview them all separately. Who's the weakest person on this team? Nine of them are going to name the same person, if not all 10. They all know who the weakest player is on the team, except maybe that person. But everybody else knows. Everybody knows. So as long as you still give that person raises and you keep them on board, everybody knows where the canary in the mine is. Canary's not making any noise. Everything's OK. Because I know I'm a better performer than this person. Why should I stay extra? Why should I put in any more hours? I'm already out, out doing this person. And so even if it's unconscious, people will, you'll find your organization isn't very good after a while. Where if you fire that person, it's a wake up call. Everybody's going, but you know what? Most of them will go, about time, about time. But guess what the next thought is? So who's the weakest person on the team? And the boss will actually fire people. And I'm not sure who's number nine. I hope it's not me. And guess who steps their game up? The whole team steps their game up a little. And I'm not saying, you know, manage people in fear. Oh my gosh, because that's, that's not a good way to do it. But a little fear is healthy. It's like if you have to stand up and do something like this and give a talk, if you have absolutely no fear and little experience doing it, you're going to do a horrible job. So, you, you know, you're nervous about it. You're trying to prepare. You're, and, and you do a better job that way. So when you get a chance to be a manager, no matter what you say to people, no matter how much they like you, if you're tolerating somebody weak on the team because legal told you you can't do it without more documentation or it's going to cost a lot, or just realize that there's a big cost to that, to that decision. Uh, other questions? Yes? Yeah, time, time just fired one of their top executives because people were claiming that he was somewhat of a tyrant, kind of controlling the highway. How do you find like, a balance between not being that high? Okay, very good question, and I'm going to answer it in a few ways. Uh, there are people that are tyrants. I, I've worked for them, and I've worked with them before, and it's horrible. I mean, they're just literally heartless, and it's all about them, and that's a miserable situation to be in, and you're going to find that in your career. No matter what discipline, you're going to, you're going to run into some of those folks, and you're going to have to figure out how to deal with them. Um, the interesting thing, though, is if the company's doing really well, like 90th percentile, the tyrant stays in place. When the company all of a sudden isn't doing well, then guess what? Get rid of them, get rid of them, get rid of them. And there was a study, and I wish I remember where it was at, but I, 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 it was probably in Wall Street, but uh, there was a study they did, and I, I, I got the animals wrong, but I think it was leopards and sheep CEOs that they'd studied, those who are kind of forceful and have an opinion and, you know, they're not always really nice to everybody, but they're really driven. And then there's the sheep who everybody likes them, but they don't really make hard decisions and drive people. Well, guess whose business does better? The leopards. But that's not for everybody sort of a thing. And so you've got to have a balance. There, I won't name the company specifically, but there's some companies, big companies on the decline right now. And it's exactly what we're talking about. Some of them let, the HR is powerful at Honeywell, but they let their HR get powerful. And what do they try to do if you're an HR person? You try to round off all the rough behaviors. You know, don't be so rude to your subordinates. Don't blah, 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 blah. And they go too far. And what actually made them good, being driven, challenging status quo, uh, forcing some things to happen that were the right thing to happen, they don't dare do that anymore because they're getting beaten up and rounded off too much and they lose their edge. On the other hand, you have people that are just out of control, and you let them go. And we fire people that have more than nailed their numbers, but they had horrible behaviors because nobody wanted to work with them, and it's not the way we do business. So it's always a challenge, and some of it's in the eye of the beholder, too. 
Some people will say, this person's a tyrant, and other people are like, I'd follow him anywhere. You know, I, I loved working for him, so some of it's eye of the beholder. But it's a challenge, and there's all of the above. There are people that aren't strong enough that are going to lead your company down the tank, and then there are people that they're strong enough, but they're just ruthless people. Look back in history. Some of the great leaders, half of them weren't nice people, even though we tend to glorify it a little bit. Okay, other questions? In the back? Not having a long-term goal of being a company executive, what would you say your uh, key characteristic is that elevated you to where you are today? Uh, delivering results and the things I talked about, the courage to drive change, that, that's what made all the difference. As a matter of fact, my boss said there's three reasons I gave you the job. He said, number one, you get results. I've known that. Your boss has been telling me that for years. I've seen some of the things, so I know you get results. And he said, number two, you're the only human resource person I've ever seen disagree with their boss in front of me. And you did it more than once. And what it was is we do these in-depth evaluations of executives. And he'd say, well, what do you think about this person? And my boss, oh, they're terrific, or oh, they're horrible, and this is why. And then the CEO would go, and what do you think? You know, the HR person that's sitting in there. And he said, everybody else said, yeah, 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 that's right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's right. And he said, you'd always on one or two people go, oh, I have a different opinion, and this is why, and here are my facts. Now, I was no dummy. I didn't surprise my boss ever, get in the meeting, and all of a sudden I'm going, oh, you're wrong, and I disagree. I told him ahead of time. I said, you know, we're going to this meeting. You and I have a very different opinion on these two people, all tied out on everybody else. We have very different opinions. For my own sake of integrity, I need to be able to say what my opinion is. You're my boss. You can shout me down if you want. That's fine. I just want to give you a heads up that here's, here's exactly what I'm going to say. But in front of the CEO, all he sees is, oh, my gosh, here's a different opinion. Uh, and so that, that be an honest part. And then the third one, which has to do with change, is we opened a big facility in an emerging market. And I went down there for the meet and greet, wear a suit, because the CEO of the whole company's coming. And so I'd be there at the door representing our business. And he comes in the door, and he comes up to me, and he goes, how'd you hire people here? He has, he's just gotten to the facility. And I go, oh, we did this, we did that. It was great. It worked good. Here's some statistics. And he said, but did you use the proven model we have in India? where we, we really do a good job, and I'm thinking, it wasn't our business, and I'm like, well, you know, how good is it, and who cares? I mean, I've got great stats here. That was my first thought, but instead I said, no, we didn't use it. And he said, most people would have said, yes, we did, even though we didn't. He said, you said no, and then he said, well, why not? Are you gonna look at it? And I started saying, well, but look at my results are actually as good as what they did in India, is how I started off, and then I thought, well, you know, it doesn't hurt to look at it. And so what I did is I looked at it, and here's 28 things they do in their hiring process that gives them such good results. And then I sent him a note, even though he's a couple levels up, and I said, here's five things that just wouldn't work, and this is why. You can't actually do that in some of our locations. Here's eight things that we're already doing that we did do in this location. And here's six things that are actually pretty good ideas that we're going to implement. And he said he was so impressed that I wouldn't just summarily reject everything and try to say, oh, no, really, I got it under control, that I actually look at what someone else did and say, hey, this is, a, this is better. That's why I got my job, according to him. Yes? It's both. It's like saying, should the hurdler run faster or jump higher, you know? And it's like, it's both. They might seem, because when you're jumping, you're not running, you know? It might seem, but, but it, you got to do both. Because in HR in particular, and this isn't true for all the disciplines in here, by the way, but for HR, you need to have a master's degree if you're going to wind up in a significant position. But you also got to have experience, and it's hard to get your first job in HR. Once you have a master's degree and you got five, seven years under your belt, you're very marketable. As a matter of fact, that's how I can tell what's going on in the economy. 
is they start calling for HR people first. Those are the first people they hire, and those are followed by finance people. Because you got somebody trying to turn a business around or realizing they got to grow and they want to have the right CFO and the right HR person. They hire them before they hire the engineers and, and other folks. Um, but it's both. Any experience you can get, and, and if it's different than the experience you had before, that's all the better. But you need to get the master's degree. And people that go it the other way in HR, they wind up with four kids and going to night school trying to get the master's tacked on later because they reach a point where they pick the other person. You're so close in competency, but the other person's got their MBA and they pick them instead. So yeah, it's both. Okay, yes? You said that in order to succeed in your career that you need to know what you want to be. You need to know what company you want to work for uh, like seven years down the line there. Um, after you got out of uh, your education, did you go, was knowing that you just wanted challenging work and that you wanted to earn, you know, decent money, was that enough of what you wanted to be that you were able to progress or did your idea it was kind of more of that. I, I, did, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And by the way, I hated the people that did. Since the fifth grade, I wanted to be a doctor. I'm like, oh, I hate you, because I had no idea what I wanted to do. And you know, I was good at accounting, but I'd go look at what my dad doing his accounting job. And this is in the days before computers, and he'd have all these big ledgers piled up. What do you do, dad? Oh, I erase this number, and I write in this one. And then I do the adding machine, and I'm like, you do this all day? And he goes, yeah, and then as soon as I get done with these books, it's time to start over again. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I didn't want to do that. And I, I told him, I want an exciting job like the garbage man. You get to hang on to the truck and, <laughs> you know. So I was kind of, I had no clue. And I got up here to, to Utah State, and it was in the days before computers. I know my kids asked me if I had running water and all that, but it was days before computers. And to sign up for classes and majors, you had to stand in long lines of people. And then you get all the way up to the front after 45 minutes, and they go, oh, I'm sorry. We just filled the last slot, you know. And so I walk in. I'm a new freshman. Gee, what do I want to major in? Have no clue. Nothing looks fun. No, Mom, I don't want to be a dentist. I want to mess with people's mouths. I, you know, nothing looked fun. And I didn't know what I, okay, something in business. And so there were two lines, business administration and business education. And I'm like, well, what's the difference? Uh, I guess I'll get an education about business. So I get in that line, it was shorter anyway. And I get up to the front and there's these nice little ladies there and they go, oh, we never get guys in this major. Right away I knew, okay, something's wrong here. I'm not, I'm not sure what it is, but like, oh, I, I, and I went over to the other line, but I had no clue. I couldn't decide between finance, HR. I, I liked numbers. I, I did like uh, leadership challenges and working with people. I just didn't know, and that's why I was going down both paths. I went down both paths until I reached a point where I either had to stay another three to six months to have be a dual major between finance and HR, or just pick one and go. So I thought, oh, I'll do HR. And then I made another bad decision. I saw this guy in a Mexican restaurant in Salt Lake, and he had on the tie and the white shirt, and he's like sweating profusely, and he looks like he's all stressed out. And I'm thinking, that's a businessman. Oh, that does not look fun. So I thought, I'll do something more altruistic. I'll be a city manager. So I thought, that sounds, I get to manage different stuff. And so that's why I pursued an MPA instead of an MBA. And as I was sharing with a, a fellow MPA here, I said, as I got into the classes a year, I realized that maybe not, because half my classes were with MBAs and half were with MPAs, and they have very, very, very different philosophies on how you lead people and how you manage performance. And I found I didn't fit too well in the one camp. But at that point, I was committed. And when I graduated, I couldn't get a job for six months. And then somebody made me an offer, and you know how you interview, and people go, oh, do you have anything else going? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I just got an offer. Then I got six offers. So I went six months with nothing, and then in about four weeks, I had six different offers. Half were city management and half were HR, and I just had to make a choice at that point. So I kind of wandered into it, to be honest. But my background helped. The finance and accounting background helped me a lot. And, and by the way, I know you got to leave. Feel free to leave. Or Okay, one more. Where was the hand over? Yes. Well, I just have a question. You mentioned a little bit when you're sitting down with somebody and you're asking them questions in an interview for a job. And you say, what's your, what's your, your biggest issue? Uh, and you, you, you kind of touched a little bit about on the honesty issue. So do you want somebody to just pour their soul out to you? Or, I am so bad at this. I am so bad at that. Well, you need, you need to help me. I'm a terrible employee. <laughs> I hate all my bosses. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it depends on what they say, but I can tell whether I do this all the time. I can tell whether I'm being told the truth or not, or whether it's a polished answer. And yeah, what I want to hear are things like, 
you know, I'm good one-on-one -on -one with relationships, but in front of a big group, I get nervous and I freeze up. Or I've been told that uh, I drive stuff along, but I forget to bring everybody along as collaboratively as I could. And so sometimes I find out somebody's not on board and I've had some project delays. So here's what I do to try to fix that. Because I know that about myself, I sit down at the start and I make sure who do I need to touch with at each point and I make sure I do it or ask a peer or a boss to keep me honest on it. I, I'm in Toastmasters, I'm learning how to speak, I've got somebody who comes to my meetings and critiques me after. That's what you want to hear is a real weakness that they're aware of and that they're working on. They're not saying, oh yeah, it was a weakness, now I'm cured though. But it's their, you know what, here's what I don't do well. And, or, or one of the other questions I say is, it's basically what did you screw up, but I say it nicer. I say, if you could have one redo in a work situation where you could handle a situation differently now that you know how it all went, what would you pick? I will not hire someone that won't answer that question. Because we get back to that, they're lying or they're perfect. And so I want to hear something like, well, here's what I thought and I screwed up because uh, I didn't, get my uh, cost-benefit analysis done. I just thought it would work out okay, and then I got tanked in the big meeting with the big guy because I hadn't done my cost analysis, and in fact, they had data that showed I was spending money and not, you know, and so I never let that happen again. Here's what I do to make sure it doesn't happen. I always get a finance person to look at what I've done and agree with me, and then I make sure that they're gonna support me and that kind of thing. So that's what it is, is give a real weakness, but, but you gotta be able to show that you're working on it too. And it can't be something like, you know, your weakness is you're psychotic and you want to have thoughts of killing people. And, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> even if you're working on it, I wouldn't hire you. <laughs> okay, I appreciate the chance to be able to talk with you and uh, enjoyed it, thank you. Thank you for the